In today's episode, we meet with product marketing expert, Ali Hanyaloglu, to discuss how to enable buyers with the information they need to make the right buying decision. Ali is the head of global product marketing at Akinio and the author of the Medium series, Provoking the Status Quo, where he rethinks what is normally done in the world of marketing. You're listening to the Meaningful Content Mixer. I'm Bonnie, a content professional focused on pre-sales and product marketing. And I'm Sarah, a content professional focused on post-sale knowledge management. Together, we like to explore what it takes to create meaningful content that is purposeful, demand-driven, and contextually relevant. We are sharing strategies, tactics, and stories that help content professionals across disciplines create more meaningful content that drives successful outcomes for their customers. Let's get started. Hi, Ollie. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to our podcast. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Ali and Bonnie, you guys work together for a little bit, but now, Ali, you're off doing something different. What are you up to these days? Yeah, so Bonnie and I used to work together at Coveo, and I'm now at a company called Aquino, uh, which is uh, in the product information management space. I head up the product marketing team here. Uh, I've been here for about almost three months now, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm curious about your experience as a content professional and, and how you see yourself in that role. Yeah, so uh, being a content professional is a key part of what we do in product marketing. I've been in product marketing for a long time now, let's just say. Um, and that's companies from large ones like Adobe to small ones today like Akinio um, and many in between. And so um, my role as a, a content professional has been from the perspective of defining the content strategy and understanding what information do we need to communicate to whom and how, as well as creating that content and publishing and tracking it as well, which is everything from blogs to white papers to videos to how-to articles, uh, the podcast, the list goes on uh, in terms of what I've had, I had a chance to get my fingers in. Yeah, and through that experience, one of the things that you've recently been doing is blogging, um, provoking the status quo. So finding things that maybe we should be thinking about differently in product marketing. And that's really one of the reasons I wanted to invite you here today is kind of share some of those things that, that you've been seeing and talking about. Um, and I think one of, one of those things has been um, just the amount of information that's being presented to people on a day-to-day -day basis and really you know, how can we create content that is filtering through the noise? Um, curious to get more insight into what your thoughts are there. Yeah, it's a really um, uh, an area that I have gained a, a lot of interest in of late. Um, it was a statistic that was brought to my attention that came from Gartner, the global uh, market research firm. And it said that 89% of uh, this was B2B buyers or decision makers uh, are overwhelmed with high quality content. Um, now you can let's think about that for a minute, break it down. First of all, it means that the information and the content that out, that's out there that we're all creating, it's really good. You know, it's mostly very, very good stuff. Um, but the thing is, is that even decision makers or people who are going to be buying products based on that information that they are looking at to help them with a the decision, they're feeling overwhelmed. So what does that mean by overwhelmed? Well, it means that there's a lot of information that they feel is contradictory. We can come back to that point. Mm. Um, they are so overwhelmed with all this great content and information that when it comes to making a decision on buying or doing something, um, they end up defaulting back to something else, sticking with the status quo, or just going with a decision that maybe is just going to cover the bare minimum. And so they never feel satisfied with the decision that they make. They never feel like it's a quality decision that they want to go forward with and grow with. Um, the analogy that I often make is to the Cheesecake Factory. So <laughs> if you've eaten at the Cheesecake Factory restaurant, you'll be familiar with the menu that you get. It's a book, right? You spend ages going through every single page. 
while you're looking at everybody else and they're trying to decide as well. Um, and you take some time, but you eventually land on something, right? You, and maybe it's something that you've had last time or you do want to try something new and you just go, well, I'll pick that. The thing is, have you been to a cheesecake factory with a group and then you sit down and you get your dish and you look around and you go, <laughs> I should have gotten that one. This is so mm -hmm. relatable, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what yeah. everybody else goes through out there when it comes to actually making buying decisions yeah. um, is you walk away from it going, maybe this wasn't the right thing to do. And, it's, and what the study is showing is because that content and that information is just so overwhelming. Mm. Interesting. Do you think as content professionals, we have to come together as a group or, or really start talking about this and, and be more stringent or honest about the content that we put out? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of learning from each other for sure, but I think it's also asking each other the hard question of, is this the right kind of information and content that we should mm -hmm. be producing? Is it really in the right format? for the audience that we're going after, or did we just think that was the case? Yeah. And part of that is actually asking each other and provoking each other um, on, on, on those tough questions. So what, what is it that we should be creating, you know, for our audience? So the answer is it's not actually up to us as content creators. That's not our decision to make. That decision of what to do comes from understanding who your target audience is or for those of us in product marketing, we call them personas. Um, that's who you uh, look towards to understand how can we guide them through their learning and decision-making process where they don't feel overwhelmed, but instead they feel very comfortable and guided on what, what to go for and what to avoid, avoid the pitfalls. Um, personas are a very powerful tool. And um, for your listeners and your watchers, I'm sure they're familiar with them. They probably have created them or they use them. And in many cases, a persona is there to you know, understand who you're going after. If it's in the B2B world, what are their job titles? What do they care about? What are their pain points? How do they get measured? Uh, demographic information. This is all great stuff. Mm -hmm. But a persona should also, or a persona study, I should say, should also be asking the question of what kind of information do they need to help them make a confident decision? Where do they go for that information? I'll give you a hint on that one. It's not always your website. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. And um, how do they like to engage with vendors, suppliers, their peers, and so on? It is different based on who you're going after. And those last things or what can help you decide how can we not, what, what do we do to help not overwhelm our target audience? Mm. Yeah, I, one of the questions, or it's a sort of a double question that I think about before creating content for this type of audience is, at the end of a customer or consumer consuming this piece of content, what do we want them to think and what do we want them to do? And I think we should have a lot of clarity on what the answer to those two questions are before we put something out there. I think too often, and I know I'm guilty of this myself, it's just we're trying to put a lot of content out there because we're not really confident about what's going to work. And we think if we have a bunch of options, then later on we can figure out, you know, through data what was successful. And really that more of that work should happen up front to be more strategic. Yeah, I would exactly. Add, I would add one more to that, which is what do we want them to feel when they're done with our piece of content? So do they feel confident? Do they feel empowered? Do they feel like a relief, a sense of relief if they read this? You know, what, what is that emotion that you're trying to evoke from the piece of content? It's so true. Uh, we have to take in both the emotional and the rational mm -hmm. in terms of the content and information that we provide. The reason being is that the emotional part of things, how we want someone to feel, how we want them to react, um, is what creates memory. And then they, what they will remember at first, the first thing is how they felt. Yeah. What will follow in that, from that is the rational, pragmatic information that you gave them. So that's something else that has to be taken into account to create that stickiness and relevance mm. 
um, in terms of the content that you're providing. Yeah, what I'm taking away from this conversation is that we have, we have a greater responsibility as content professionals for our audience's time and what's, what's worthwhile to them. And we can't just consider our impact on that, but also the full landscape from the user's perspective of everywhere yes. that you're information. Yes. Remember, they, um, if you're working for a company that's selling products to other businesses, um, your target audience is going to your competitors and others in the landscape. That could be influencers, for example, analysts and so on. So they're getting information in multiple formats from multiple people, all saying slightly different things that are contradicting each other in, in one way or another, whether that's directly or not. That's really confusing. You understand why people walk away feeling overwhelmed and mm. then just fall back to status quo. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, which is uh, don't just look at what you are saying and mm -hmm. what you are doing, but look at what your peers are saying and doing as well. And if you all sound the same, guess what? Somebody's going to go for things like price yep. or look for a different way that's not going to work out for them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that you mentioned um, with, with per, is personas and that being a way that we can create better content or more um, impactful content. What are some things that like maybe the top three things that you think should be included in a persona? Dr. Top three things that should be included in a persona. That's a really mm -hmm. good question. Um, pain points are always key. Um, think about when you, you know, you're talking with friends and how many conversations start with the words, don't you hate it when, <laughs> right? It's the same thing happens in the business world as it does in the personal world. Um, there's always a pain point or a frustration or just a situation that someone is, uh, anxious about, wants to address, maybe actually keeping them up at night, um, by the way, hint for you, never ask in the persona study, what keeps you up at night? Never ask that question. <laughs> um, but you'll get to the answer for it indirectly. That's the first thing I would put in there. Um, the second thing that's really important on this topic, which I see missed in a lot of personas, is where do you go to get high mm. quality information to help you? Like I said, it's not always your website. We've done this study before and we've asked this question and we were finding things like analyst reports, uh, customer stories. Mm -hmm. These are the things that came up top. Um, it just depends on who you're going after and at what level they're at as well in terms of their authority. Yeah. Um, that's another thing. And then the other one would be asking if you're talking about the B2B world or even a B2C world, actually consumers too, which is, how do you like to find out about the companies that you buy from and their products? And it's, again, it's not always the website. Um, and they maybe would also say things like, I like to find out about them by joining their webinars. You know, in, in the COVID-19 world, talk about being overwhelmed, right? How many <laughs> webinars do we have to go and attend and watch and see yeah. in our LinkedIn feed? So many natural reaction into a world where we can't have face-to-face -face anymore. Um, now, maybe it's a case of that's okay. People do like to go uh, to attend these webinars, but why? Is it because they want to sit through 54 PowerPoint slides in 30 minutes? Or is it an opportunity for them to ask a question of mm -hmm. those vendors and of those experts or to see what their peers are asking in the Q&A pod, for example? It's this kind of sort of analysis that needs to be done uh, to help identify what is the right content and information in the right format too. Uh, to your point earlier on, Bonnie, I see so many times um, marketers who basically start off with, let's create an ebook. That's their <laughs> starting point. Uh -huh. Why? Is ebook the right thing? What do you mean by ebook, by the way? Uh, <laughs> and you know, that's not the right place to be starting from. The right place is to start from, what do we want that individual to feel and do next? Mm -hmm. What yeah. information will help them with that? 
and then based on our persona, how do they want to get that information? Yeah, and that it's more granular than just what's the format or the delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. Then once you're within that, the ebook or the webinar example that we've talked about so far, be more granular. What are the what's the specifics within that experience that that customer is looking for? Yes, exactly. Um, Ari Hoffman talked about this in one of your previous episodes, which is um, turning that breakdown you described, Sarah, into a journey mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. them through that. It's, it's tempting to be able to just give everybody all the information, right? Give them all of it and it'll be great. <laughs> no, sometimes you actually need to break it down mm -hmm. and put that into a journey based on what they are trying to do, what their journey is. If you are talking to the chief marketing officer, that journey is going to be different than talking to the head of IT, which is going to be different than talking to an individual who wants to buy a new pair of earphones. Um, each one of those is very different. I uh, cannot make generalizations of it, but break it down based on what makes sense for them. Yeah, I, I hear it. I hear it so often. It's so it's one of those things that's absolutely easier said than done because you hear it, it sounds like truth, it sounds like, of course we should be doing that. And then you get into production mode and it, it's so much harder to do than it sounds. Yeah. And I, I think asking the question why, like you, like you mentioned, Ali, is really key. Cause I remember, you know, being asked to, to do an ebook at one point and asking, oh, well, why, why are we, we doing this on this particular topic? Um, and the response was, oh, cause this, this topic always works and and it was like yep. there okay so there's no like real reason that we're talking about this or anything that we actually you know so there was there was some strategy which is we want people to read this and so we're putting this out but that was kind of as far as it had gotten at that point and so asking the question why can really uncover even for yourself if what you're doing is the right thing to do or will actually make those impacts. And so starting with why, and then if you're able to answer those questions of what, um, what do we want them to do and think and feel, um, I think all that combined could really lead to some good content. Yeah, agreed. Starting with why is my, one of my favorite mantras. Uh, I'm a fan of Simon Sinek, Sinek. Sorry, Simon, if mm. you're watching and I'm <laughs> um, but, you know, he has written a book on this, you know, and you yep. always start with why. Uh, too many organizations and content authors and marketing professionals, they all still want to feel like they need to start with the what. What do we do? Who are, you know, who are we? No, start with why. Simply because um, people don't buy into what you do. They buy into why you do it. Mm -hmm. And that's something I always try and keep in mind as I think about everything from specific pieces of content to messaging strategies to, to go to market. Mm. Is there anything else going on with your blog that you want to share with us, how that's going so far? Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about my blog. So um, it's on Medium, which I've actually been enjoying using um, as, a, as a blogging, as an authoring platform. Uh, so if you've not tried out Medium and you're a writer, I, I recommend doing so, it's fun. Um, uh, it started off simply because I, I had some things uh, in my head and on my chest that I wanted to get out there that were frankly frustrating me uh, in terms of approaches that were being taken with respect to content, marketing, um, and so on. And also th related topics like uh, sales and sales enablement, an, an area mm. that's in my field as well. Um, I just want to challenge them and more than just say, well, that sucks. I actually wanted to say like, you know what, here's, here's a way to approach it. That maybe you haven't thought of before. Um, and hence the title provoking the status quo. Um, so it's been covering everything from specific types of content. Um, one article of mine that I've had some great feedback on is around competitive comparisons. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that I used to do a lot um, yep. and I, they drive me nuts when I see them again now. Um, so, <laughs> so I wrote about that a lot um, and I'm actually working on a new one as a preview coming very soon, which is all about stop marketing your features all the time mm -hmm. and why you don't need to do that, why you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm working on next. 
to me. Yeah, does that connect at all to jobs to be done? That's something that I've been exploring a bit more lately. Of course, my experience is more on the post-sale, customer support, customer success side of things. Uh, and I've more collaborated with the product side rather than you know, ran those functions. And I'm learning more about jobs to be done and that perspective that it can bring to both personas and the feature conversation, that it's not about the feature, but it's, it's what folks are trying to do on the other side of that. Yeah, I've recently become aware of this jobs to be done concept and idea. Uh, it's really interesting. It's one of those, yeah, why weren't we doing that before kind of thing. <laughs> so um, I too am beginning to learn about that and thinking about how I can apply that as well. Yeah, and I'm, I'm starting to explore how I can keep that framework in mind for the post-sale journey as well, even though it seems to be more of a product design or innovation uh, methodology, I think it could really be applied on the post-sale experience too. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a couple of examples from what I've uncovered so far is one of the most famous ones is the McDonald's milkshake analysis. They, McDonald's was looking to increase the sales of their milkshakes and they did the standard ask folks how they want their milkshakes to be different or better. Do you want different flavors? Do you, what, what do you want mixed in? Do you want the cup to be different? And they asked all these people, they implemented their suggestions and it didn't increase their sales. So what they did instead is they actually observed who was buying milkshakes and they found that they were often sold in the morning between six and 8 a.m. by men alone in trucks. <laughs> and they unpacked that a little bit more, they realized that these folks, this persona, was actually buying a milkshake in the morning as something to do during a commute on the way to construction jobs. Mm -hmm. And that th the job to be done for that milkshake wasn't to satisfy a sweet craving. It was actually something that served a purpose during their commute. It filled them up, it lasted the whole commute, it was something they were able to use with, you know, consume with one hand so they could have another hand safely on the steering wheel. And that, in that case, the, the competition for the milkshake isn't other milkshakes, but it's coffee and it's donuts and it's a breakfast mm. sandwich. And it's kind of reframing your perspective in that way. Oh, that's I've, I've never had a milkshake for breakfast before, but when I <laughs> read the article about the McDonald's study, first of all, I started to think maybe I'm missing out on something. Um, <laughs> secondly, it just goes to show how what you think is the right thing to do is not always the case. And it really, they did have to change everything that they did with respect to positioning, um, when it was sold, uh, how, you know, what it was made up of. Like they said, they didn't have to change ingredients or add new flavors or anything like that it was more of the packaging mm -hmm. that was involved. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the sales went up in a completely unexpected way. Um, right. That lesson learned applies to so much as what we do as content professionals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that sometimes asking folks what they want isn't actually the best way to innovate or improve. It's, it's really, it's more of a study and mm -hmm. considering their opinion, but also considering what they're trying to accomplish. Exactly. Yeah, like, wasn't it Ford who said, um, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse? Right. That's right. I read, yeah. I read recently that there's no actual evidence that he ever said that, <laughs> but... I, I read it in a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, there's no actual evidence that he said that. He may have said something like it, but apparently because it was first discovered as a quoted phrase, I think, in uh, the 1970s or 80s. Yeah. A long time after Henry Ford. I would oh, argue so even funny. if he never actually said that, it's a it's a useful thing to repeat. I think it conveys an important point. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. We can, we maybe can Ford, can maybe he'd be one. proud. Maybe he'd be proud. If if Ford had asked this, not <laughs> Ford said this. <laughs> 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 so you mentioned, you know, the different levels of buyers having different needs and different purposes. How do you um, how do you how do you know what information to provide or how do you enable them through that um, decision-making process? Yeah, um, you used the key word there, which was enablement. Uh, in my career, I've both led and been involved in sales enablement in all different kinds of ways. And it's probably something um, your viewers and listeners are familiar with around sales enablement, even as content professionals, you've probably been involved in that in some way or another, whereby, Sales enablement is there to essentially provide 
the information tools and process and frameworks to help salespeople retire quota as efficiently as possible. We can apply the same ideas to our customers and our buyers as well. Um, there is a, a notion of buyer enablement too. And it's really about helping them make those really well-informed decisions that they are super confident and comfortable in. Um, so it's, it's the information and the content for sure, um, but it could be more than that. Uh, there's many different aspects uh, that they need to take into account when making uh, decisions on their, where they're going to spend their hard-earned budget, mm -hmm. um, whether that's an individual or whether for it's a large organization where there are 12 people involved in the decision-making process, for example. Um, you need to guide them through what that process should be. So it's not just about what content's out there, but um, who should receive that content? How should it be shared? Who else should be involved in the process? Mm. Um, who else can they talk to beyond just you? Is there someone else they can be interacting with and collaborating with? Um, these are all different aspects that are coming up now as a, a concept called buyer enablement. Mm. I'm, I'm surprised that that is new to me. I, I love it. Uh, the, the renaming of sales enablement to buyer enablement, I think it makes so much sense. I think, I wonder if some people might think, well, that's BS. It's the same thing. It's still to drive sales. And sure, you know, we work for organizations that need to, you know, get revenue. But the idea of, of approaching it from a buyer enablement perspective, I think makes so much sense. It, it only increases our empathy towards their experience and their needs. And I think it can help us frame things up in a way where we're setting ourselves up for more success as well, because from day yes. one, we're approaching it about, about what they need. And you're going to have better sales cycles. You're going to have better onboarding in the world of SaaS and churn, they might be might less likely to churn in the future because you've enabled them appropriately from the beginning. Exactly, exactly. It, it's, it's old school now to think, you know, get the big deal. That's what's important, right? Yeah. Uh, get the big purchase, make them buy more. That's old school thinking just simply because very quickly after that, customers just aren't happy. Right. And if they, you know, they may have gone and given you the check, that doesn't mean they'll come back. Yeah. And yeah. In a world where we, our business models are based on subscription and mm -hmm. renewals and we measure churn, keeping customers coming back is equally, if not more important than the actual initial purchase itself mm -hmm. and making sure that they are satisfied, that they're getting the help that they need. It's an ongoing process now. It never ends. Yeah. 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 Instead of getting that big logo, it's getting the right logo. It's getting the right. Yeah. Logo. Yes. Exactly. So they'll stay, stick around. Yeah. <laughs> Instead yeah, of getting I, the big deal, it's about getting the right deal. Right deal. Yeah. And honestly, I wonder how many folks have actually done the ROI on the other side of a bad deal. I've been part of internal efforts to try and save a churn and the amount of time and resources that go into it. I, I can't imagine that on the other side, it ended up being a cost benefit for the company. Yeah, exactly. You're going to see a lot of uh, leaders out there are looking at uh, something known as CAC, customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's getting measured more and more of late. And simply it's a way to be able to say, are we throwing all of our resources just to try and get the logo or the big deal? Or are we being smart and efficient about how we're growing as a business? Mm -hmm. And so um, this is why you're starting to see concepts like product-led growth, for example, mm -hmm. um, which are really came about as a means of trying to get a grip on those customer acquisition costs. I love it because, you know, the, the conversation started with, we have all of this information about all these great things that you can buy and you can do and people are feeling overwhelmed, but it seems like if we really just understand the people um, at the center, the, the target audience, um, then that will really help. So that's asking those important questions, asking the why, 
thinking about the customer and what they want them to think and do and feel creating those personas that really help us um, have a, a holistic view of who our buyers are and then enabling them and the sales team to have a partnership um, to help keeping, keep the journey moving forward. Yes, exactly. That partnership is a two way thing. It's first of all, to those who are responsible for creating the content uh, to identify what makes sense and when and for whom. Um, but then also with your target audience and your customers too, and then building that partnership with them. It makes me think of a type of content I've seen for years on conference websites. Uh, before we were all virtual and when we would travel and spend money and time to attend conferences, a thing I'd often see is the convince your boss page. Yes. Yeah. And yes. I think that's actually such a great idea. And maybe we all need to take a version of that. And <laughs> so what's the buyer enablement version of the convince your boss? It's the checklist of I'm a buyer, either a primary or a secondary decision maker. And you tell me what I need to know in order to make sure that I'm covering my bases. Exactly. Yeah. That's a, that's a great example. One of the originals. Yeah. And think about if you've read those or if you've used them yourself, think about this. Who was the persona in that case? It was the boss, the manager, mm -hmm. right? One who's gonna, who's, you know, worrying about travel budget and why is this conference so expensive and why are you out of the office for a week at this thing? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. for them. So it's not written in the style of, Hey, this conference is going to be amazing. Look at this famous football star. Who's going mm -hmm. to be, you know, it's all about, your employee is going to be away from the office for a few days, but they are going to come back with so much rich information and best practices that you can apply right away. It will actually cost you a lot more in training over a year to get this information, et cetera, et cetera. It's written very different style. Mm -hmm. That is a great example of mm -hmm. persona, buyer enablement, the right kind of content in the right way for the right amount. Yeah. Yeah. And then they don't have to sift through all kinds of information all over the web because they have the information that they need already from you. Yep. <laughs> yep. How many times have you asked your boss to say, can I go to a conference? What's the first question? Why? Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. What is that? Why? Why do you need to go? Well, this is, this is great. I mean, I love the information that you're sharing and I can definitely see how it all comes full circle. Um, is there, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us today? Um, one other thought, cause, um, I come across this a lot, um, which is format for your content does not matter. I, I, I see so many endless conversations around what format should this be? Is it an ebook? Is it a web page? No, don't put it on the blog. Uh, endless conversations that go around and around like this and kind of like, I want to say, don't worry about the format. Focus on what do you need, or sorry, I should say, how do you want your audience to feel, to Bonnie's point earlier on, and what is it that they need to know to help them make a confident decision or just be informed in a very um, positive way? Um, whether you do that as an ebook or carrier pigeon or smoke signals <laughs> or virtual reality, depends on what they want to do and how they want to get it. So to wrap it up, we like to ask a question to all of our guests. Um, you know, we like to seek inspiration in unexpected places, but where do you find your inspiration? So where do I find my inspiration? Um, the, the one I think about are actually my daughters. Um, and it's simply because they ask questions about the world that they see around them that they're looking to daddy for for an answer and i have to break it down for them as simply as possible mm -hmm. um and you know trying to explain to them when they ask the question why is the moon not always round <laughs> i'll try and explain that to a kid and that inspiration that i'm talking about there is it makes me think about how do I break down and simplify a problem into something that people walk away from going, oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my inspiration I always get. And, and, I, and great content that out there, you just see that. You see they take a really complicated topic, 
break it down and simplify it without making it seem too simple. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. I know as expected, I learned a lot today. So happy to have you join us. Uh, it was great to be here. I love this conversation. <laughs> thank you so much. And I wish you the both all the best uh, with this project. Thanks so much, Ali.